uh, let's start today's session. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and welcome to our second neuro webinar of the month. Uh, it's a pleasure to have with us uh, Dr. Irene, a uh, consultant neurologist from Hospital Subirang Jaya, who is going to chair our session today. And we're extremely uh, grateful to have Dr. Hugh, uh, who's an expert in neuromuscular disease with us today as well, who is going to speak to us on the topic of myasthenia gravis. So over to you, Dr. Irene. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Maber. Hi, everyone. Nice to see all of you again. Uh, I think myasthenia gravis is a very... Uh, interesting topic and so is myasthenic crisis and I'm sure a lot of uh, doctors out there has experienced you know and has the experience of palpitation of treating myasthenic crisis of which me myself included so today we have the honor to have uh, Dr. Hugh here to share with us his experience of managing my MG and the crisis yeah so, uh, Dr. Hugh Fuliong is a consultant, physician, and neurologist at Sunway Medical Centers, Langor. He received his undergraduate medical degree from IMU Malaysia and subsequently got his fellowship in general neurology in 2014. Pursued his interest and obtained fellowship in neuromuscular disease in 2016. And Dr. Hugh is well accomplished with multitude of research and publications surrounding inflammatory neuropathy and inherited neuropathy. He's also a winner of the Japan Society of Pompeii Disease Award in 2018. He's an active member of Peripheral Nerve Society and International Society of Apheresis. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Hugh. Dr. Hugh, please. Um, thank you, Dr. Irene, and thank you, Mabel. Um, thanks for the very kind introduction. I think I, I'm not sure whether I've given you the correct CV. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very short one. <laughs> anyway, thanks. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the College of Physicians Malaysia for invite me, inviting me to speak on this topic. Um, I hope you can hear me well. And um, uh, my topic today will be approach to management of myasthenia gravis and also a uh, myasthenic crisis. Um, so this is the menu for today. And um, I will probably emphasize more on the therapeutic modality in MG and also the management of the myasthenia crisis. So if time uh, permits, I will probably touch a little bit on the emerging treatment strategies before I actually sum up uh, everything uh, for the day. So myasthenia gravis is probably more accurately uh, being uh, labeled as acquired myasthenia gravis. Uh, it's actually an antibody-mediated autoimmune disorder of the neuromuscular junction. So, um, uh, this is due to a pathogenic autoantibody, which is most commonly uh, acetylcholine receptor antibody in up to 85% of the cases uh, directed towards the acetylcholine receptors uh, in the skeletal muscles. So um, you, we also see other antibody as well, uh, which is mainly the uh, muscle-specific kinase, tyrosine kinase uh, antibody, mass, uh, in those who are acetylcholine receptor negative uh, myasthenia gravis. Of course, uh, up to about 10, 12% of these patients are lacking of these two antibodies or even uh, other forms of um, uh, antibodies. We call them seronegative MG. So the prevalence of uh, myasthenia gravis is around 20 per 100,000. And the incidence every year uh, it can be higher you know, at about 20 per million populations. Uh, being a female are three times more likely to get MG compared to men, uh, especially for those who are younger than 40 years old. So um, the precise origin of the autoimmune uh, response is actually not known. So it is thought to relate to a timing histology, whether this patient actually have hyperplasia or whether they have thymoma. So thymoma, in fact, is seen in around 15% of the patient with acetylcholine receptor antibody positive. Um, uh, other association would include uh, some genetic association, HLA, which uh, among Chinese patients, um, if you have a HLA BW46, you are more likely to get ocular myasthenia gravis. And being an Asian, when you have a HLA uh, DR3-B8 uh, and also DR9 positive, you probably have a more uh, uh, tendency to get an early onset of uh, myasthenia. 
So the classical characteristic manifestation in myasthenia gravis is actually fluctuating muscle weakness or what we call fatigability. So resulting in ptosis, dipropia, or dysarthria, sometimes dysphagia. And uh, of course, in a generalized MG, you get uh, fatigability in the limbs and also in your axial muscle, including your neck as well. Um, there are also atypical clinical features of MG, uh, which is mainly seen in uh, anti-mass antibody uh, positive MG, where the bulba muscles and also your truncal muscle involvement are more prominent and patients very frequently develop uh, uh, obvious uh, muscle atrophy. And um, these are the clinical subtypes, which is very important for us to recognize because it actually determines the way we manage the patients and also the prognosis of these uh, patients. Okay, let's look at um, what happens to the patients uh, with myasthenia gravis over the past uh, probably about three quarters of centuries or more, more than half a century. So, when you can see, uh, although we see a much improved in terms of outcome of a patient with myasthenia gravis over the years, uh, which is highlighted in green, the mortality rate itself despite initially you know, improved, we have not seen much changes since then, it's been plateauing yeah, over the past like half a century. So this is the same as uh, those patients going to remissions, which is highlighted in blue. Uh, you can see that they are pretty much the same over the years, meaning that we have nearly, you know, um, we have found some improvement in terms of the treatment of patients with MG, but we have not really found a cure. Uh, in terms of how to manage uh, 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 MG. So when we treat MG just like we treat other diseases, you need to have an endpoint, meaning that you need to have a treatment goal. So uh, the widely used treatment goal for MG is actually defined by uh, Myasthenia Gravis Foundation of America, we call it MGFA, where um, they are looking into how well can a patient achieve uh, 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 with treatment or even without treatment. So the most commonly uh, discussed topic is actually on whether this patient can com uh, achieve what we call a complete stable remission or what we call a CSR. So in CSR, it's actually defined as someone with MG have completely no symptoms and no weakness for more than a year and they are receiving no medical therapy. So the question always come out uh, 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 is whether these patients can actually uh, achieve complete stable remission. And it's going to be rather um, uh, difficult to achieve such a, a, a target. So a more practical target would be to put the patients on a treatment, achieve what we call a minimal manifestation status. So where the patient can have no symptoms of any functional limitation, but they can have some form of weakness that do not interfere with their daily activity or their daily life. So this is probably something which is more achievable uh, than not having to achieve complete stable remission. So um, uh, the treatments of NG is initiated when someone is being confirmed to have myasthenia gravis. So um, usually the first line of treatment is to put them on what we call um, acetylcholine uh, esterase inhibitor uh, and more commonly known as pyridostigmine in this country or mestinone. So mestinone or uh, choline esterase inhibitor uh, is usually used uh, uh, as a first line and it increases the amount of acetylcholine available for binding in the neuromuscular junction. So we normally start them with a low dose, about 15, 30 milligrams twice a day. You know, you're gradually increasing the dose slowly to achieve um, a, a, a good uh, outcome. So, but there are always uh, a limiting factors because some of the patients, they develop uh, gastric cramps and also you know, diarrhea because of the, uh, the side effects from the medication. But what you need to understand is putting uh, them, uh, putting patients on uh, 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 chlorine esterase inhibitor rarely induce complete remission or it really is also cause sustained relief of an MG symptom because these are the very short life medication effect that will wear off very quickly and also they do not actually affect the disease progressions so but of course um, 
they might be beneficial in some patients who are having very mild, you know, uh, 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 symptoms, you know, they are very purely ocular disease that are not severe. Uh, uh, they can be quite well managed with the pyridostigmine. Okay, so once you put them on the uh, pyridostigmine or acetylcholine uh, esterase inhibitor, you just optimize the dose and you monitor them. For those patients that are having persistent symptoms, uh, or ocular myasthenia gravis, for those that have persistent symptoms despite optimizing uh, pyridostigmine or they have developed side effects, you probably have to consider giving them um, uh, uh, some steroids uh, just to maximize the effect of the uh, treatment. Um, so this is actually a, a studies uh, uh, of um, just one moment. Hello. Yeah, can hear you. Can hear you well. Uh, later I'll come later. Okay. So um, so this is actually a randomized control trials. Uh, on ocular MG patients that we put them on uh, treatments uh, with prednisolone. So actually a very small study and uh, of uh, patients comparing ocular MG patients with prednisolone and also versus uh, placebo. As you can see from here, those patients that receive uh, uh, prednisolone itself, more than 80% of them will achieve a minimal manifestation status, meaning that they have minimal symptoms. After a median time of treatments of across about 14 weeks, and uh, with an average dose of about 15 milligrams per day only. Okay, so meaning that for those patients with ocular MG that do not achieve good response with uh, pyridostamine alone, you can actually consider putting them on pregnisolone therapy. Okay, but putting patients on a uh, uh, corticosteroid itself, you know, um, uh, normally have some limitations because we don't want to put them on too long, you see. So if someone that need required steroid for more than a year or someone that when you put them on steroid, you know, they, they achieve some form of improvement but is insufficient to improve, uh, you might want to consider also at the same time switch them over to a non-steroidal immunosuppression therapy because you do not want to get uh, the, the long-term complications uh, from the side effect of the steroids. There are some evidence, uh, but also, of course it's not a strong evidence. There's some evidence that suggests that in a patient with ocular MG, when you put them on corticosteroid, you might delay or reduce the frequency of them progressing from ocular MG to generalized MG. We know that some of them um, will progress, more than 50% of the patients with ocular MG will progress to generalized MG in about two years time since the onset. So, um, Putting them on steroid might kind of like delay or you know reduce the, the, the risk of them being uh, a generalized MG, but evidence is not strong uh, yet at the moment. Okay, so what about uh, generalized MG? So once the patients have been diagnosed with generalized MG, similarly you will put them on chlorine esterase inhibitor, but of course if they are not well treated and the symptoms are not well optimized you can always put them on uh, steroid therapy as well, okay? So the first line immunosuppressant for generalized MG, again, is also steroids, okay? Generalized MG patients, when you put them on steroids, more than 70% of them will achieve either a market improvement or they will go into remissions. So how do we put them on steroids? Um, there are actually two approach uh, with a different school of thought. Some patients will, uh, some physician will prefer to use a large dose uh, at the beginning where patients uh, are being put on one milligram per kilo per day initially and gradually you titrate down the steroid dose. And steroid here I'm referring to uh, prednisolone. Yeah? Uh, well, gradual reduction in the dose uh, while maintaining uh, 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 remission or what we call a minimal manifestation status. But you need to be aware when you put the patient on high dose steroid, when you put a myasthenia gravis patient on a high dose steroid, you always have to watch them very closely. For example, if someone that comes to you with 50 milligram of uh, uh, 50 kilo uh, of body weight, and when you put them on 50 milligrams uh, of uh, prednisolone, you have to be aware because when you put them on high dose steroid, 
one third of these patients are going to develop what we call a temporary exacerbation of symptoms of myasthenia gravis uh, within the next one or two weeks time. And these kind of uh, uh, conditions can last for a few days. And um, if they are very mild, then it's fine. Just put them on some mastodon just to bridge them over this period of time. But if the symptoms are more severe, you probably have to resort to giving them short acting, you know, a, a rapid uh, a treatment, for example, giving them a plasma exchange or giving them a course of immunoglobulin just to tie them over this period of time while waiting for the steroid to work. But some school of thought things that, you know, why do you need to do that? You probably, why, why not you just put them on a low-dose steroid and you gradually titrate it up? For example, you put them on 10 milligrams of a steroid a day and then you gradually push it up to 20 uh, every other day, you know, while you're watching and see whether they actually deteriorate. There's also another way of doing it. Okay. So the question is, how long can a patient receive steroids and at what dose? Is higher dose the better? Or is it necessary to reach like 100 milligrams? If someone that comes to you with 100 kilos of body weight, do they actually need 100 milligrams per day of steroids? And um, in a patient with mild MG, when you start them on steroids, do you also need to start them on, you know, uh, uh, one milligrams per day, the kind of uh, uh, high, uh, high dose? Okay, this is actually a, a very good paper from uh, Japan. So it's usually a cross-sectional study from Japan on the use of steroid among patients with myasthenia gravis. So it's a huge uh, 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 collection of patients of 590 patients. They divide these patients into three groups where uh, based on the dose of the prednisone that they receive throughout you know, the course of the treatment. And they look at the proportion of patients who develop minimal manifestation status better with five milligrams of prednisolone, which they taper off over the years, okay, for more than six months. So you can see from here, the proportion of patients in the uh, that achieve minimal uh, manifestation status in the low dose group is much higher than those in the high dose group. So, but when you look at the severity, the maximum severity throughout the entire course of the disease, you see a much uh, less severe disease for those in the low dose group. You might think that, look, of course, la, the small, the low dose group, you treat those patients with a, 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 a steroid. Uh, the, mild, the, 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 the low dose group patients are those that with, the, with the milder form of uh, severity of the disease. Of course, they will achieve a better uh, what that, um, uh, outcome with a minimal dose of steroid. But actually, this is not true. When you look at um, the amount of uh, uh, proportion of them who required treatment, with IDIG, plasma exchange, and also with what we call a, uh, uh, early fast therapy uh, uh, to get them better, the, those patients in the low dose group itself have a higher proportion who receive all this treatment comparing those with a high dose group. So what does it mean? So it means that um, the ins, the, this, this indicate that the low dose group people, right, they did not always indicate that they have less, less severe disease. It just means that those required low dose penicillin, low dose steroid, possibly can suppress the disease better because eventually, a higher group of this kind of patients will achieve um, minimal manifestation status. So, in summary, low dose regimen is it is superior to a high dose regimen or even superior to the intermediate dose regimen in maintaining treatment goal, which is minimal manifestation status. Okay, so what other first line therapy that is available other than steroid? Because we know that you're not great, you just can't give steroid for so long. So this is where you need a uh, non-steroidal immunosuppressant agent. So um, this is actually a, a, a randomized trials on the use of azathioprine among my generalized myasthenia gravis patients over a period of 36 months comparing to those on placebo. Um, when you first diagnose patients with myasthenia gravis, you put on steroid, of course, yeah. So when you add on azathioprine in this group of patients, you can see from here, majority of the patients will be were able to win off prednisolone after 36 months. But more importantly, when you can you see from here, after 12 months only, you will see the benefit of the azathioprine, where at that time, you can 
reduce the steroid dose while maintaining minimal manifestation status. So in summary, azathioprine had a steroid sparing effect, but you have to be very careful because when you put the patient azathioprine, you've got to put it at a substantial you know, uh, time because um, you can only probably see the effect after about 12 months. So that's why early initiation of immunosuppression therapy is actually quite important. What about uh, MMF, mycophenolate uh, morphotil, or better known as CELSEP? So if you were to put a generous myasthenia gravis patient on CELSEP on top of the penicillin versus placebo, you do not really see a significant difference after 12 weeks, as you can see from here. Uh, whether an MG patient treated with steroid, whether you add on a uh, mycophenolate morphotil or not, in 12 weeks time, you do not see much difference. What about giving them at a longer duration, 36 weeks? Again, when you look at these studies, 44% uh, of the patients on CELSEP reach a minimal manifestation status comparing to just comparing to 39% of them on placebo, which reached minimal manifestation status. There's not much of a difference and they are not significant. So giving them uh, uh, cell sap on top of penicillin does not significantly okay, change the need of the steroid or the outcome of the patient with MG. So recently, uh, the recommendations uh, from the uh, guidelines also to include the use of what we call a metrotrexate in the treatment of patients uh, with myasthenia gravis. So this is a 12-month multi-center randomized control trials looking at uh, metrotrexate 20 milligram orally every week uh, in a patient with uh, uh, s valve coronary receptor antibody positive MG. As you can see from here, so the primary outcome looking at whether there's any difference in terms of dosing of penicillin for those with metrotrexate and those without metrotrexate. You can see from here, there's no significant difference, meaning that there's no steroid sparing effect with metrotrexate. So what about outcomes? So when you look at QMG, QMG outcomes uh, in myasthenia means that this quantitative myasthenia gravis score, uh, looking at the outcome of the patients uh, with myasthenia gravis after treatments, you can see that adding on metrotrexate to the prednisolone itself do not give you any significant better uh, outcome uh, in those patients with MG. So these are the, the usual first line uh, therapy that we see. What about other immunosuppressant uh, therapy? For example, cyclosporine and also tacolimus, which are actually uh, belongs to a group of calcineurin inhibitors. So in this group, um, uh, in this study, you can see when we add on a cyclosporine to the patients with myasthenia gravis, you see a significant improvement yeah, from the baseline. Okay, uh, On those patients with cyclosporine, with the improvement of a mean QMG score of 3.5 compared to placebo. So it means that cyclosporine A itself works in patients with MG. And because of that, when it works, it actually reduces the need of the steroid and it has therefore a steroid sparing properties. But cyclosporine is something which is really used among neurologists in this country. And uh, it is being widely used mainly among those neurologists in Japan. Similarly, when you look at tacolimus, this is actually a randomized uh, 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 trials that was done uh, in the Japan, looking at the use of tacolimus plus penicillin and also versus penicillin alone. So the tacolimus actually reduces the duration of what we call early phase treatment. We come to hospital, we give you penicillin and all these things. It's called a body early phase uh, therapy. So if you add on a tacolimus, it actually reduces the duration of you needing uh, early phase uh, treatment in the patient with MG. And also, it um, reduces the need of you requiring plasma pharesis or even IV penicillin uh, for rescue purposes. And it reduces the daily dose eventually, uh, the need of a patient with uh, penicillin in patients with myasthenia gravis. So 
we know that some patients with myasthenia gravis, they go into myasthenic crisis. So the lifetime prevalence of a myasthenia crisis requiring intubations and also mechani mechanical ventilation is about 20 to 30%. So myasthenia crisis is actually uh, defined as weakness from the myasthenia gravis that is severe enough to necessitate intubations or ventilation or also, also airway protection. Um, myasthenia crisis is also can be the first manifestation among MG patients in about 20% of the patients with MG. So intubation, intubation is generally required if the patients develop respiratory muscle fatigue, where they start to develop hypoxemia, hypercapnia, and they have difficulty handling the secretion because of bow bow weakness. And uh, of course, if you can manage them with a non-invasive ventilator, they will be very good, provided this group of patients are fully conscious and they have no severe hypercapnia. So uh, in my own practice also being recommended, um, I will normally discontinue the use of pyridostamine uh, according to the inhibitor when the patient going into crisis simply because uh, it might complicate your airway secretion management. You know that they actually have a lot of slivers and a lot of secretion from the, from the oral airway when, the, when they are on uh, uh, pyridostamine. So temporarily stop it because uh, it is actually not needed to support vital function in the patients uh, when the patient is having crisis. So... Um, but the most important thing in managing uh, myasthenia crisis is identifying and addressing the possible precipitant of MG. So the most common things are drugs, for example, beta blockers, you know, and certain uh, 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 antibiotics, you know, um, and also, you know, sometimes uh, patients having some electrolyte imbalance and things like that. Uh, infection is a common cause, for example, lung, and even patients going for surgery, including chymectomy itself, is actually a risk of them going into uh, myasthenic crisis. Um, so the mainstay of treatment is to get them into ICU, okay, maintain the airway, and monitor the respiratory functions. So this is actually the guideline that was recently updated, uh, uh, International Consensus Guideline for Management of Myasthenia Crisis. You can actually download it, and uh, they have a you know quite an extensive. Uh, 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 explanation on how to manage patients with MG and also myasthenia crisis. So, when during crisis, what do you do? You treat them. So, you treat them with either plasma exchange or IVIG. So, these are short-term immunotherapies where um, they actually give a rapid clinical response via different mechanisms. So, plasma exchange itself, you wash the blood, you remove the circulating uh, anti acetylcholine receptor antibody. By doing so, you produce improvement. Sometimes you can see even within days in most of the patients with acquired uh, myasthenia gravis. So IVIG also have a similar efficacy compared to plasma exchange, but the actual mechanism of IVIG producing improvement is not clear. So it is being thought that it is due to some form of uh, competition with uh, autoantibodies and also on the FC receptor binding. And um, uh, studies have shown that uh, when you give them one gram per kilo or two gram per kilo, it's somehow having the same uh, similar efficacy. But the standard regime is to give them two grams per kilo of uh, IVIG. Um, when patient is having worsening weakness, but they're not yet going to crisis. So giving them IVIG two gram per kilo, uh, comparing to placebo, produce a clinical meaningful improvement in terms of disease severity which normally start within days, and it can actually last for up to 28 days. So you give them IVIG, you will expect them to improve at least for a month. This allows you to put them on sufficient dose of steroid and also immunosuppressant to maintain clinical remission until uh, the uh, effect of the IVIG actually wears off. So comparing IVIG and also uh, plasma exchange, when you were to look at efficacy based on improvement in a QMG score, they are actually comparable or even up to a month. So the duration, so the duration or effectiveness of the IVIG itself and also plasma exchange, as you can see from this graph, they are pretty similar. They are not much of a different in terms of uh, these two treatment modalities. And of course, based on studies, uh, IVIG and also plasma exchange itself can even last you 
for up to 60 days. Okay. Some patients just do not respond. You know, we, we do have some patients with mycelia gravis that somehow do not respond to your conventional first line or second line uh, immunosuppression drugs. They do not respond so well to the steroids and they frequently come in with crisis or, you know, they require plasma exchange or IVIG. So these are a group of patients that we call refractory MG, which can be seen sometimes in up to 20% of the patients. So these are MG with chronic causes, with moderate to severe symptoms, and also with functional impairment. Somehow they're just ineffective in terms of receiving uh, our response to standard therapy. They have repeated myasthenia crisis or even severe exacerbations. They will need repeated treatment escalation. You know, sometimes they will even need uh, IVIG, plasma exchange regularly. Or some of them, they do not respond. It's not because the, the treatment is ineffective, but it's just that they cannot stand the side effect from the treatments. And of course, some of them, they do have certain comorbidity that stop them from receiving steroids. For example, when you have very severe uncontrolled diabetes, you know, uh, you have stroke, you have a lot of thrombosis that you now giving them IVIG is not actually the options and your blood pressure is constantly at the low side where plasma exchange is not a good idea. So in this group of patients, what are the options? You can pulse them with cyclophosphamide. You can give them a loading dose of uh, IV uh, rituximab. Or you can, of course, give them regular plasma exchange IVIG. Or you can even use newer drugs like Ecolizumab. It's a complement inhibitor. Of course, and order them to try or get something new uh, 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 to, to try on them. But if all this fails, you might want to consider stem cell transplant. So this is um, uh, the paper that was published many years ago on uh, cycle, the use of cyclophosphamide among patients who have refractory MG. It was a very small study, you know, 12 patients. Then they follow up these patients after cyclophosphamide about one to nine years. And it's proof that it is safe, of course, effective. Um, 11 out of 12 patients experience dramatic clinical improvement, starting from five months that can last for even up to 7.5 years. And um, um, some of the patients actually have, you not know, they're going to treatment free uh, in remissions up to about 7.5 years. So what is more interesting in this study is, so after putting them on cyclophosphamide, you reboot the entire immune system. It's just like, you know, your, when your computer hang, you know, your, 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 your system, your computer laptop just hang and you need to reboot the whole system. So when you reboot the entire system, somehow these patients, uh, they respond to immunosuppression agent that previously failed. For example, this patient has been on azathioprine and metrotrexate in the past. I didn't work for them. But when you put them on cyclophosphamide, you reboot the entire system. When you put them on the same immunosuppression again, they actually respond better. But the thing is, cyclophosphamide is very short life. You, know, you give them money for six months, then you know, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't sometimes last very long uh, from all clinical experience. Of course, the study can tell you that a lot. It looks like many, many years. So during this period of time, you need to quickly put them on immunosuppression to actually maintain them. Yeah. Another option is to load them with uh, 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 induction uh, of uh, uh, IV rituximab, which is an anti-CD20 uh, monoclonal antibody. Uh, rituximab is being increasingly used among patients with refractory uh, MG, especially those with anti-mass uh, uh, anti, uh, MG, because anti-mass MG uh, is actually IgG4-based uh, 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 immune, uh, uh, immune system where it does not uh, induced complement uh, fixation. While your SL choline is actually IgG1. So they induce complement fixations. So when you do not induce, uh, uh, when, it, when it does not induce complement fixation, uh, giving them IVIG is have a very limited uh, role on, uh, in terms of the outcome. So of course, there are many other uh, trials of a new monoclonal antibody in the pipeline. But the most uh, convincing evidence at this moment is the use of a C5 monoclonal antibody, yeah, uh, complement inhibitor, which is equally to map. Okay, uh, rituximab. Um, as I mentioned, frequently used in M refractory MG and also uh, uh, muscle-specific kinase MG. 
And so far, it has been shown to have a good safety profile with a very minimal side effects. Of course, you know, you do have some patients who actually having a lot of uh, uh, reaction to the rituximab, but majority of them shows uh, uh, improvement, especially those with refractory uh, MG. So complement inhibitors. So the role of uh, complement uh, uh, fixation and also a membrane attack protein uh, has been suggested previously, you know, many, many years ago uh, in a study that shows that, look, uh, most of the time, uh, the pathogenesis behind mycelial gravis is actually because of this complement fixation. So the use of ecorizumab, which is actually a humanized uh, monoclonal antibody against the terminal complement protein C5, um, is actually proven to be, you know, uh, effective and, uh, you know, have a very quick rapid onset after the infusion and then the effect itself can even last you for about 30 months. So it is actually something which is very prominent from the initial study. So REGAIN is the, uh, the landmark uh, trials for using ecorizumab in patients with uh, myasthenia. Um, somehow in this study, okay, somehow in this study, when you look at uh, the first column, which is a pre-specified uh, worst rank uh, ANCOA score, it didn't really show us much improvement. They, not say much improvement. They didn't show any. They didn't really show any significant improvement in terms of the uh, the, the MG ADL activity or daily living score, uh, even uh, uh, other quality of life score as well. So uh, it's a little uh, disappointment, but. When you look at the individual score analysis itself by sensitivity uh, 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 analysis, mm -hmm. you can see that they are all significant. Somehow, the study statistic itself, uh, using the worst rank uh, uh, in COVA score itself, did not produce a significant uh, value. But uh, in fact, clinically, they do actually respond. So when you extend, when you extend uh, the trial longer, okay, when you extend the trial longer. Uh, with patients receiving uh, IV uh, ecorizumab, you can see that 75% of the patients have reported uh, less exacerbations and up to 66% of the patients have reduced in terms of rescue therapy administrations and also up to 83% reduction in MG-related hospitalizations. So ecorizumab itself works. Okay. What about thymectomy? Um, for many years, thymectomy has not been something which we know what to do and when to do or, you know, on who we should uh, uh, advise them on uh, thymectomy. Until 2016, where the MGTX, which is uh, Myasthenia Gravis Thymectomy Study being published in NEJM, on patients who are less than 65 years old, antibody SCR positive, generalized MG with disease duration of less than five years. So if you have a patient who have a non-thymoma, a non-thymoma uh, MG with the thymus that fulfill this criteria, okay, uh, giving, uh, uh, putting them on uh, for thymectomy give a good outcome in terms of QMG score improvement, uh, quantitative myasthenia gravis score improvement, and also the need of lower dose per insulin over three years time. So you can see from the graph here uh, of uh, MG uh, TX study. So thymectomy itself proved effective in reducing the severity of the uh, mycena gravis based on quantitative uh, mycena gravis score and also the need of a lower dose of a penicillin of up to 11 milligrams a day. Okay. But you need to be aware that thymectomy it should be an elective procedure. So do not rush into pushing the patients for thymectomy because it should be something which is being performed when the patient is completely stabilized and deemed fit to undergo surgery because thymectomy itself is actually a major risk factor to put the patient into mycelic crisis. So do we do thymectomy for patients with ocular MG? Um, there's no strong evidence to, to tell us that, look, you should go for a thymectomy, but 
a retrospective analysis of more than 100 patients with ocular MG who went for uh, thymic, uh, 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 transdermal thymectomy shows that up to 26% of these patients will go into remission, meaning that they are asymptomatic and without need of any medications, basically cure. Lah. And up to 60% of 58, almost like 60% of the patients will eventually improve at, after thymectomy. So um, if someone that has uh, ocular MG, uh, that is not well treated, with a pyridostic mean having problems with steroid or even immunosuppressants and symptoms still, you know, um, not uh, well controlled, you can consider thymectomy in this group of patients. So in conclusion, um, management of MG should be individualized. And um, choline esterase inhibitor alone might be sufficient in some patients with very mild MG uh, conditions. Immunotherapies itself, as I can show it to you earlier, um, your MTX, uh, metotrexate, your CELSEP, in clinical trials do not actually produce a very good you know, statistical uh, uh, outcome. But these are on clinical trials. But in real life, many of us use this medication. We use metotrexate, we use even CELSEP for patients with refractory MG and we do see some of the patients who actually, you know, it, it works for this group of patients. So choosing the most suitable treatment itself is very important because you don't want to give them uh, an a immunosuppressant that doesn't work, but in fact, they develop complications from the side effect of the immunosuppressant. Of course, the lowest effective dose should always be determined when you put them on treatment. So thymectomy is something which is whenever indicated. Yeah, and uh, newer therapy itself, whether it will change the overall outcome of the MG over the next 10 20 years, we do not know. The only way for us to know is we wait and we see the result from uh, future studies. So, I just want to let you know that uh, those data that I presented earlier, there are some which show positive results and some that do not show positive results, but eventually, the decision to put the patient on treatment is still based on the clinician's experience and uh, how, how well and how comfortable are you using the immunosuppression to treat patients with uh, myasthenia gravis. Um, don't just treat based on clinical trial because clinical trial is clinical trials. You know? um, we, we don't need to do a randomized control trial to prove that parachute actually works. So you know you don't uh, ask 10 percent 10, 10, 10 10 uh, uh, person to jump from the sky and five on parachute and then the other five not on parachute and then you determine which one died. You know, um, you, you don't need the kind of study to prove things work. So treat with your own experience and you know how, how comfortable you are uh, in, in, uh, in your own management, uh, which of course, um, uh, if you have the, the, the facilities and also the expertise, by all means, you know, treat them well. With that, thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hugh. That was really a very interesting uh, uh, presentation from, from Dr. Hugh itself. Now we would like to take questions from the floor. Now we have 260 participants. Yeah. So, uh, so I read the Q&A box there. There's a, oh, a lot okay. of questions already. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. okay. So you read for me or I read myself? You can read yourself. Yeah. Okay. So um, so the first question, anonymous attendee. <laughs> so what is the initial dose to start oral steroid and how we taper down the dose of the steroid? Okay. So if you are a more um, uh, kind of like uh, daring physicians, you put them on high dose, which you normally start at one milligram per kilo. So how to taper those? Type how to taper down the steroid. You reduce five milligram every week while maintain uh, uh, the patient in uh, in remission. I meaning that when they are well. So if they are okay, you just taper down one uh, uh, five milligrams every week uh, until they reach the lowest dose of the prednisolone that can maintain them well. But of course. If you think that this patient needs immunosuppression, at the same time, you need to put them on immunosuppression while you taper down the steroids. 
So after IVIG for my senior crisis, are we allowed to start oral steroid or need IV steroid then switch to oral? No, you can put them on oral. You do not need to give them IV uh, steroids. I will frequently put my patient on oral steroids, maintain them at high dose. Yeah. So sometimes you might even want to maintain them on high dose for a month at least. Yeah. Before you actually uh, taper it down. So the next question. Why do one third of the patients have temporary exacerbation in the first week? After? We do not know. So we know that uh, high dose steroid is actually a, a, a risk factors for exacerbation. Just like uh, you know, uh, 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 many other drugs, you know, uh, including um, what called um, it, and all these things. These are the things that cause the steroid. Uh, these are the things that uh, cause exacerbation in the myasthenia. Um, would you start steroid in patients with a lung nodule at the periphery of the lung where diagnosis of TB malignancy cannot be excluded? That is something which is uh, 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 based on your own clinical experience, I would say. Um, TB on steroid, I have never really had a problem with patients uh, with TB on steroids. In fact, in many of the TB, including TB mentality, we, in fact, we put them on steroids. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, yeah. So, but when it comes to malignancy, then it's something which is a little bit tricky. Uh, simply because you want to know what malignancy is that, whether you already have a biopsy result, and whether your steroid itself will mask the malignancy. Some of the malignancy, for example, if you have got a lymphoma and things like that, you probably want to get the diagnosis sure uh, before you actually put them on uh, on steroid because I know the otherwise you know, the hematologist will probably curse you later and say oh why are you going to string the string the leaf node or the tumor and then at the end of the day they couldn't they couldn't uh, uh, biopsy the the, uh, the the nodule or something like that so that is very individual I think discussion with your uh, chest physician colleague will be something which is beneficial so when to introduce azathioprine the moment when penicillin is introduced or shall we wait and see if the patient can taper off from prednisone? Yeah. So when to introduce uh, azathioprine? So if you think that these patients will need long-term steroid or immunosuppression, you straight away put them on azathioprine while you start them on uh, steroids. So if you think that these patients have a very mild disease and then you can maintain them with steroids for a period of time, you might not want to give them azathioprine. So how do you know that? So you great if the patient having uh, not so... Um, a severe MG, and you put them on steroid and they improve, and you slowly taper down five milligram every week until you reach 7.5 milligram a day. So there are some evidence to say that when you reach 7.5 milligram of prednisolone or less, for example, five milligram a day, you can maintain them with this dose of steroid for a long period of time without seeing much complication from the steroid itself. So in this group of patients, you might want to consider them to be just on prednisolon at a very low dose rather than adding on azathioprine, which, which they probably don't need. Yeah, so these are the group of patients that you might not want to uh, put them on azathioprine. So is it common practice to admit patients that we are planning to start high dose? Uh, no, you do not need to admit the patients when you want to put them on steroid. If you think that this patient is going to have uh, come to you in a clinic and you see them having worsening of weakness, but they are not into crisis. Huh? So these are good patients that uh, when they have worsening of weakness, you put them on the steroid and you do not need to admit them. You just tell them, look, I put you on this dose of steroids and you go back, okay? If you feel worse, if your bicycle gravis grav does not improve, Okay, you come back and you see them at a shorter interval just to review them to make sure that they are okay. So alternatively, you can use the low dose regime. Yeah. So if you use cyclophosphamide for induction, how soon will you resume penicillin? After six months. So your monthly uh, of uh, what call that? Uh, cyclophosphamide for six months. And after cyclophosphamide, you put them on, uh, only then you start them on uh, steroid or immunosuppression. Do not use 
my, my own practice is I do not put two at the same time because cyclophosphamide is a very potent uh, immunosuppressant. When you put them on some other immunosuppressant, you might suppress the immune system even uh, 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 more. So that will very prone uh, for them to get infection. Even cyclophosphamide itself, you have to be very careful because they get infection because of cyclo and then you don't want to put some more uh, 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 immunosuppressant to cause them to be more immunocompromised. Okay. Um, can we start treatment for new case based on clinical diagnosis without biochemical? Yes, of course. So if the patients have got a clear um, uh, clinical evidence of fatigability, they have, you know, truncal weakness, you no, know, they have bauba. So clinically, when they are MG, you treat them as MG. So this is a very common question that um, uh, a neuro neurologist face. Very often you see patients, uh, you see uh, doctors refer to you for um, RNS, single fiber. And also, you know, uh, because the patients clinically have ptosis, but uh, the patient's uh, antibody is negative. I want to do a RNS and I want to do a single fiber to confirm the diagnosis of MG. No, you don't need to. Single fiber, RNS, and all these things are supportive. They can be negative. So what happens if they're negative? Are you going to just say that, look, your ptosis is nothing and then you go home? No, you still have to treat them as though like they are MG because they can be still seronegative MG and they can be still single fiber negative MG. Uh, all these tests are not 100% foolproof. They are only supportive and they are not diagnostic. Diagnostic is clinical. So if you think that this patient has uh, uh, clinical evidence of MG, you treat them as MG. Sorry, I didn't touch about this because um, the topic given to me is probably more to management. Okay, uh, steroid myopathy and also MG on steroid. Uh, have you encountered difficulty? Yes. So steroid myopathies. Okay, when you look at MG myopathy, uh, MG weakness, they are more prominent in small muscle. For example, your eyes. Uh, sorry, your 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 ocular, your bulba. Okay, when it involves bigger muscle they involve the proximal upper limb muscles. Very rarely you see someone that comes to you with a proximal lower limb muscle and they turn out to be MG. Of course, they are. But very rarely you come to someone that comes to you with a proximal uh, 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 muscle weakness and turn out to be MG without other signs of MG. So if this patient clinically is an MG with uh, no ptosis, uh, dipopia, you know, ophthalmoplegia, you know, with bauba, with a proximal muscle weakness, you know that this is MG. But if someone that when you put them on steroid and suddenly they develop lower limb proximal, this could be due to the problem with the steroids. So this could be due to the steroid induced myopathy. Then you have to very quickly reduce the steroid dose. And when you reduce the steroid, when I mean, you see them improve, you know that this is uh, most likely a steroid induced uh, myopathy. Okay. Um, some autoimmune thyroiditis, hyperthyroid patient are uh, associated with MG and my need non-selective beta broker to control the symptoms. Um, any alternative? Uh, that, uh, of course, beta broker are not something that we use for patients with, uh, what do you call it, um, uh, myasthenia. And uh, there are many other ways to control your heart rate. I think there are newer uh, heart rate limiting agent they can use to control the heart rate. I can't remember the name already. Uh, but I think discussion with your cardiologist and also your endocrinologist will be something which uh, beneficial because uh, you do not want to put them in a beta bokeh and cause them to you know, go into crisis. Um, yeah. Seen a case look like ocular MG with bauba, but resolved totally after five days of IVIG. Is it common? Will they be in remission for a month without any MG treatment? I, I think... Uh, it's, 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 it's quite rare to see someone that comes to you with uh, no, ocular MG and then give IVIG, they are totally well and then they, they, they don't go to remission. Normally, MG, you will see them to be, you know, uh, uh, recur when you stop the treatment or the, when the treatment effects goes off. You probably have to make sure that this patient is not a GBS patient. So some of the GBS patients, they can present exactly like, you know, uh, MG. So they have ocular paralysis or uh, 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 ophthalmoplegia, ophthalmoplegia, they got ptosis, you know, sometimes they got like, facial weakness and all these things they can, or even with bauba in, involvement, but they are GBS. So you treat them with IVIG, they're resolved and they don't come back. So
So these are not MG patients. You have to be very careful differentiating between these two. Of course, if you know, do an LP, send a gangrosite antibody. Um, so in a COVID-19 era, patient with MG that require intubation uh, and high dose of steroid for, for COVID-19, that may exacerbate MG. Any role of prophylactic, to prophylactic IVIG to prevent crisis? Patient with MG that require intubation? No. Okay. Um, when, when, uh, when you... Uh, Okay, I think I understand your question. So your question means that uh, patient with MG got COVID infections, require intubation and also high dose steroid and you worry the high dose steroid will exacerbate the MG. Um, these, these are, these are kind of like, uh, uh, in theory, your high dose steroid might exacerbate MG, but we do not give prophylactic IVIG to, to prevent that. You don't give prophylaxis IVIG to prevent the crisis. And you give the high dose of steroid and you wait and see whether the patient actually deteriorate or whether the patient actually develop crisis. Then only you decide whether to give them IVIG to treat the crisis because of the high dose steroid. So you don't give prophylactic uh, uh, high dose steroid to treat, to prevent the crisis because one third of them will develop, not, not all of them will develop a uh, crisis. So in a, in a patient with MG not improving on pyridostigmine started steroid in AZA, how fast should we taper up the AZA and at what dose should we achieve? Okay, uh, so if you have start steroid and also azathioprine, how fast you taper up? So I normally start my azathioprine at 25 milligrams a day. So I will taper up every one to two weeks, double the dose, meaning that 25, one or two weeks later, 50, and one or two weeks later, 75, and you double it up, uh, and you'll add on 25 milligrams every one or two weeks. Every time when I do that, I make sure that the F, the full blood counts is fine. They don't go into uh, uh, neutropenia or pancytopenia. I make sure that the liver is okay. Yeah, when, every time when you do that, you make sure that the uh, liver and the full blood count is okay. You add on 25 milligrams. Yeah, so how much do you need to achieve? You need to achieve at least at least 2.5 milligram per kg of azathioprine. So normally, uh, the usual dose that you need to achieve is at least like 100 or 125 or even up to 150 milligrams per day. Um, how do you know that you have achieved a good uh, dose? Sometimes it's very difficult. Yeah, you don't know whether this patient actually need uh, uh, 100, 125. Sometimes even 2.5 milligram per kilo itself is insufficient. You might want to even go up to 3.0. So how do you know that? How do you do that? I personally will look at the patient first clinically. If the clinically the patient is well, I can continuously taper down my steroid. I know that the azathioprine itself, you know, is sufficient. The second way of doing it is if you are not sure, you can always look at what we call the MCV. Look at the patient MC. If, you, if the patient compliance to the azathioprine and the patient have uh, effect with the azathioprine, you normally see the MCV will gradually going up to about 100, 100 something. So when you when you have seen that, then it give, give you not, not a definite, but it's, it's, at least there is some guide for you to know that look, the patient is taking the azathioprine and the effect is probably already there when you start to see the MCV becoming bigger. Okay, uh, okay Hugh, Hugh, yeah. I think. Uh... You got the uh, very popular, you know. Yeah, you still got 12 questions, but yeah, the yeah. time is up already. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> Maybe Dr. Hugh later can just uh, type, uh, type us the answer here and then after that, can, we will can, post it onto Facebook can. or into YouTube for the can, rest no of problem. Yeah. Okay. Can you so, send me the question? I, I don't know how to do this. Thing. Oh, it's still at the Q&A box over here. Then you see the Q&A box there? There's yes, a yes, type yeah. answer. Okay. Huh, then you just type inside and then we will screenshot it. Okay, can no problem. So many sure. good questions, no? Yeah, lo, these are all very relevant yeah. questions, you know. I hope I hope I I, I whatever that answer uh, the question is benefit you all. Yeah. yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah, it is. And uh, we can yeah. We we also, you know, like uh, you're very we can see that you're very passionate about your 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 job and your 
you know, like uh, in the way you treat your myasthenia gravis patient, you know. So uh, until the audience also can can feel it and be inspired, you know, all of them you ask all these uh, very, very relevant question. Yeah. So uh, uh, I think we really have to stop because time is uh, okay. up okay. already. It's four p.m. But uh, uh, I would like to tell the audience, you all actually can go to YouTube. Please uh, tell your friend if you all miss some of uh, Dr. Hugh Fulion's talk. You all can go to YouTube. And go to the the academic of uh, physicians uh, uh, YouTube subscribe site. You can see. Uh, you can repeat again, Doctor Doctor Hughes' uh, video. Okay. So uh, I think uh, we thank Doctor Hughes uh, the usual way. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and okay, thank you, Doctor Hughes. You. Thanks. Yeah. Thank okay. You, bye. Okay. Bye, bye, bye. everyone. Yeah. Bye. So I I will re I will reply this uh, question later. Huh? Uh, or you want to not later? Or later, just, how you want to? Oh, okay, I just, I just, I just copy down the thing first. All the, all the questions. Ha, okay, can. I think I can copy. Yeah. Can just can copy can. It. Let me just save it first. I'll email it to you. I will. Can can. Okay. Just one moment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe the time is up. Yeah. Yeah yeah. I have screenshot it. Okay. I have okay. I have save it. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, okay, everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Stay tuned again for next uh, Thursday. We are having another speaker. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank My you. Son, I think. Oh, it's Dr. Hugh again. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah.